currently being considered by the Senate. In addition, the Defense Department has made its own changes to its acquisition policy, and there have been countless recommendations made for improving acquisitions by various commissions, think tanks, and non-governmental organizations. Still, as we'll hear today, problems do persist. On April 29, 2008, the subcommittee held a joint hearing with the full oversight and government reform committee that focused on the cost overruns and scheduling delays that persisted throughout the Department of Defense's acquisition system. The centerpiece for that hearing was the Government Accountability Office's 2008 Assessment of Selected Weapons Programs. At that time, the General Accountability Office found that the Department of Defense's largest weapons programs had exceeded their original cost by $295 billion, and their 2009 report showed little improvement. I do have to note, as an aside to this remark, that I also saw in the GAO's report uh, that there was no such assessment for performance of DOD's portfolio it had been precluded because the Department of Defense did not issue timely or complete selected acquisition reports on its major defense acquisition programs. And I'd like, uh, during the course of the remarks, somebody to address why that wasn't done uh, and why we're left without that valuable information, if you would. In these rough, tough economic times when Americans are out of work and families are struggling to make ends meet, we have to have to redouble our efforts to ensure that every precaution is in place to avoid wasting taxpayer money. Contrary to the longstanding recommendations of GAO, the Department has still not fully implemented a knowledge-based approach of its weapons systems and programs. It boils down to the need for the Department to take some common sense steps in its processes, such as testing prototypes to ensure that they meet all program requirements before starting production, confirming that manufacturing processes are repeatable, sustainable, and capable of consistently producing quality products and making every effort to keep program requirements from changing in ways that cause increased costs and scheduled delays. Now, that seems a no-brainer. Uh, it seems to be a best practices, and the question that I have that I think GAO asked at the very end of its report, why do you need laws to do things that are best practices? Why do you need to continue to be whipped with new uh, procedures in your own place that, uh, to get these things done that ought to be done by common sense to anybody that's ever run a small business or a household on that? And so if somebody will address that would be helpful. GAO found that none of the 42 programs assessed have attained or are on track to attain all the required amounts of knowledge at the critical phases in the acquisition system. As an example, one of the programs which Secretary of Defense Robert Gates designated as the Department's highest priority acquisition in 2007 is the Mine Resistant Ambush Protected Vehicle, or MRAP, and its new lighter and more agile MRAP All-Terrain Vehicle, or MATV. The cost of this critical program grew by 161% from 2007 to 2009 to in large part the problems that were discovered during testing that was initiated after production began. Nevertheless, according to GAO, the new MATV program still has concurrent production and testing schedules that are likely to require post-production fixes and result in cost growth and scheduling delays. In fact, all 6,644 vehicles are scheduled to be delivered by the time developmental tests are scheduled to be completed. I understand that the military has deemed this an urgent requirement, and that may be somewhat of an exception, and we can talk about that, but I question whether all of the programs that are moving forward that have not met those requirements on time fall into that category, and I question why we're making the same cost of the mistakes over and over again. On May 8th, Secretary Gates directed every component within the Department to take a hard, unsparing look at how they operate, with the goal of finding real, long-term cost savings in the defense budget. I applaud the Secretary for taking this important step, Congress also has to do more in that effort. The IMPROVE Act that was recently passed by the House makes critical changes to help bring down the cost of our defense programs and save taxpayer money. I hope the Senate will act on this legislation, too. Uh, I never miss an opportunity to report that there are some 249 bills that have passed the House that are sitting over in the other body uh, waiting for them to do something. This would be an important one for them to take action on. As Secretary Gates noted, given America's difficult economic circumstances and powerless fiscal condition, Military spending on things large and small can and should expect closer, harsher scrutiny. That scrutiny continues today. Mr. Flake. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for holding the hearing. Appreciate the witnesses coming forward. Um, members of Congress and taxpayers alike have long been concerned about reports of cost overruns, uh, billions of dollars, uh, federal dollars going to cost overruns associated with defense spending and uh, weapons systems. Congress can and should exercise its oversight responsibilities when it comes to spending, particularly uh, when it comes to defense spending. 
whether it's uh, relatively small defense uh, uh, earmarks uh, that allow members of Congress to give a no-bid contract to a private company or multi-billion dollar defense weapon system being handled by the Pentagon, uh, defense spending remains difficult to rein in. That's one area that I've been concerned about, and I know it makes your job more difficult to deal with the congressional earmarks that come as well, and, and I'd like to hear uh, some of, uh, of what you have to say about <coughs> uh, that process. Uh, it appears that we have an ally in the Pentagon. Um, as the chairman mentioned, uh, Secretary Gates said military spending on things large and small can expect closer, harsher scrutiny. And that's what this hearing is all about. And uh, I'm glad that to be a part of that uh, uh, tougher, harsher scrutiny. And uh, I look forward to the testimony. Thanks. Thank you. Now we'll receive testimony from the witness panel before us today. Uh, I'll introduce all of them uh, before we start. Mr. Michael J. Sullivan serves as the Director for Acquisitions and Sourcing Management at the United States Government Accountability Office. His team is responsible for examining the effectiveness of agency acquisition and procurement practices and meeting their mission performance objectives and requirements. He also manages a body of work designed to help the Department of Defense apply best commercial practices to better develop advanced weapon systems, and he holds both a BA and an MPA from Indiana University. Mr. John Roth is the Deputy Comptroller for Program and Budget in the Office of the Undersecretary of Defense. He has been in the Senior Executive Service since 1990 and is currently responsible for the budget review and analysis of all defense programs. Mr. Roth is also an honorary professor at the Defense Systems Management College. He received his BA from the University of Virginia and earned an MPA from George Washington University. Mr. Roth has also completed a number of prestigious programs in executive excellence, national security leadership, and senior management. Dr. Nancy Spruill is the Director of Acquisition Resources and Analysis for the Undersecretary of Defense for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. In this capacity, she is responsible for all aspects of ATL's participation in planning, programming, budgeting, and execution system, the congressional process, and the defense acquisition system. She serves as the Executive Secretary to the Defense Acquisition Board and is responsible for the timely and accurate submission to Congress of selected acquisition reports and unit cost reports for major defense acquisition programs. She is a certified acquisition professional and has received several distinguished honors and awards, including Department of Defense Medal for Distinguished Civilian Service. She holds a BS in mathematics from the University of Maryland, as well as an MA in, and a PhD from George Washington University. So I want to thank all of you again for coming here to testify today and sharing your substantial expertise. It is, as you know, the policy of this committee to swear you in before you testify, so I ask you to please stand and raise your right hands. If there's anyone who's also going to uh, be responding to the questions, I'd ask that you also have them stand as well. Do you solemnly swear to or affirm to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth? The record will please reflect all the witnesses answered in the affirmative. And with that, we would be pleased if Mr. Sullivan, you'd please give us your remarks of around five minutes or so, and you'd know the, the lights. You're familiar with those. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Flake, members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss the Department's management of its major weapon system acquisition programs. My statement today is based on uh, the report we did on March 31st of this year that assessed uh, the portfolio of major weapon system acquisitions over at the Department. And it includes observations about DOD's effort to manage its portfolio the knowledge attained at key junctures of a subset of 42 weapon system programs that we drilled down into, and the department's implementation of recent acquisition reforms. We made two observations this year on the department's overall portfolio management. First, priorities were clearly examined uh, for this year's budget and reset. In fiscal year 2010, the Secretary of Defense proposed canceling or curtailing programs with projected total costs of at least $126 billion that he characterized as too costly or no longer relevant. Congress supported several of the recommended terminations. Second, the portfolio did grow to 102 programs in 2009, and that increase of five since December 2007, the last time we had selected acquisition reports to do that analysis. And the cost of that growth added that growth, the additional programs added about $72 billion uh, that entered the portfolio. Thirteen programs, including the future combat systems, left the portfolio. 
those programs took a total cost of about $179 billion with them out of the portfolio, including over $47 billion in cost growth. As you stated, Mr. Chairman, we weren't able to place a value on the overall portfolio or determine its cost growth this year due to the lack of selected acquisition reports available from the Department. I think a lot of that had to do with the changeover in administration, but I'll, um, I'll, I'll let the, the Department explain that, I guess. We plan to do that analysis again this year, and we've, the selected acquisition reports are back in place, so we do have those. Um, some observations from our assessment of knowledge on the 42 programs that we drilled down into and looked at. At the program level, there's still kind of a mixed picture. While program knowledge is increasing, and we've found that for the last couple of years now, none of the 42 programs we assessed have attained all of the requisite amounts of knowledge that are needed at key junctures in the program to keep risk in place. Our analysis allows us to make the following observations. First, the newer programs in the portfolio are beginning with higher levels of technology maturity, and this is a very good sign. Uh, but they are not yet benefiting from a lot of the early systems engineering reviews uh, that, for example, the legislation that just passed will bring in and what the department has brought in in their own policies. We haven't seen that taking place yet. We hope to see improvement as that does come in, get a better match between uh, capabilities that are needed and the resources available. Second, programs that have held critical design reviews, which is more or less the second juncture in a program where you need to re reduce risk uh, for systems integration. Uh, in recent years, those programs have reported higher levels of design knowledge, usually in the way of releasable design engineering drawings. However, Few are using prototypes to ensure, ensure design stability, and again, that was uh, a facet of the acquisition reform legislation that we hope would pick up. Um, third, most programs still rely on after-the-fact metrics to get manufacturing processes in control before they go to production. That's something that we think should be done with statistical process control and other ways. They should be able to get those processes in control much sooner than they do. Um, uh, fourth, most programs continue to change key system requirements after programs start. The department has put a lot of policy in place and the acquisition reform legislation addresses this too and we'd like to see that improve in the future. Many programs continue to struggle with software development. It's a huge issue on these complex weapon systems and they, they continue to have problems. And we have found that uh, many programs, program offices that manage these weapon systems uh, rely on non-government personnel um, more than they used to and that reliance seems to be increasing. That's something we want to keep our eye on. And I'd like to make some observations about how DOD is implementing the reforms. As you know, it's still relatively early, just under a year since they went into effect. Both DOD's December 2008 acquisition policy revisions and the Weapon Systems Acquisition Reform Act of 2009 require programs to invest more time and resources in the front end of the acquisition process when programs are just beginning or actually even before they begin. Uh, and they doing this to refine concepts through early systems engineering developing technologies so that they're more mature and building more prototypes of both systems and sub subsystems before system development actually starts. We made two observations concerning how well the department is implementing uh, the reforms. First, the department is incorporating acquisition reforms into the newer acquisition programs. In fact, ten, eight of the ten programs that uh, were new in our 2010 assessment that had not yet entered system development, which is the milestone B, which is really where an acquisition program begins, reported that they either have or have plans to hold the very important early system engineering reviews uh, prior uh, to, the, to the milestone B decision. This is consistent with both DOD's policy and uh, the reform legislation. Second, the department has established the new position of the Director of Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation, 
And this group uh, is already up and running and has already weighed in on a number of programs, some new programs in order to get more realistic cost estimates and other programs that have been in trouble, including the Joint Strike Fighter program, uh, which just went through, uh, you know, a drastic kind of a budget scrub. And, and I think that this, this new position, the, the CAPE, did a, did a pretty nice job in, in uh, defining the risks on that program. And I believe that we're, we're seeing signs of that that uh, new position um, resulting in more reasonable cost estimates. To conclude, uh, I'd kind of like to echo what the chairman was talking about. I'd just like to offer a few thoughts about other factors that should be considered so that we make the most of today's opportunity for meaningful change, especially when we have the leadership we have in the department right now that seems to, uh, as Congressman Flake said, uh, is stepping up and trying to make some good decisions. First, poor outcomes on these programs, delays, cost growth, reduced quantities, have been persistent for decades, and everybody has known about it. If we think of these processes as merely broken, then some of the targeted repairs that we have in this reform legislation should fix them. I think the challenge is greater than that, and if we understand that current inefficiencies are right now, they're kind of accepted as a cost of doing business, then the challenge for getting better outcomes is greater. It really becomes much more leadership uh, oriented than anything else. Seen in this light, it'll take considerable and sustained leadership and effort to change the incentives and inertia that reinforce this status quo. And I think the Congress has a role in that as well. Uh, second, while actions taken and proposed by the Department and Congress are constructive and will serve to improve acquisition outcomes, one has to ask the question why extraordinary actions are needed to force practices that are sh should occur normally, I think just as uh, the chairman stated. Clearly, more independence, methodological rigor that we're now beginning to get from the CAPE, and better information about risk areas like technology will make estimates more realistic. On the other hand, realism is comprised, is compromised as the competition for funding within the Pentagon encourages programs to make themselves appear affordable. Reform must recognize and counteract these pressures as well. Finally, if reform is to succeed, then programs that present realistic strategies and resource estimates must succeed in winning approval and funding over those that present potential capabilities for unrealistic costs. And this will take a firm cooperative effort between the Department and the Congress. Mr. Chairman, this completes my statement. I'll be happy to respond to any questions. Well, thank you, Mr. Sullivan. I, I want to, again, congratulate you and your team for the work on that and how helpful it is to all of us. Thank uh, you. Mr. Roth, unfortunately, he used your five minutes as well, as so we're going to skip over you. No, I'm only kidding. We, <laughs> <laughs> we do want to hear from you as well, and uh, so I appreciate your comments now. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, uh, members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to participate in this hearing and for your continued support of America's armed forces. I am here today representing the Office of the Comptroller and the annual budget process in the Department of Defense. The budgets we develop for congressional consideration <clears throat> each year include the amounts requested for these acquisition programs. As a result, our office has, in fact, you know, considerable interest in acquisition reform, which is in the subject of today's hearing. Uh, we are currently executing the FY10 budget. We're working with Congress on our FY2011 budget request, and we've begun internally working already on the budget for fiscal year 12. So it's clearly an overlapping and complex process that we are trying to manage as, as best we can. As we proceed, we have been directed by Secretary Gates, as has already been quoted, to take an unsparing look at how the department operates. In his recent speech, the Secretary explained the goal is to cut overhead costs and to transfer those savings to force structure and modernization within the program budget. In other words, to convert sufficient tail to tooth to provide the equivalent of roughly 2 to 3 percent real growth, resources needed to sustain our combat power at a time of war and to make investments to prepare for an uncertain future. This policy builds on the progress that has already been made over the past couple of years, including the initiatives, initiatives with significant impact on defense spending. First, it builds on the Department's progress in acquisition reform, which we'll discuss this morning, including the creation of the Office of Cost Assessment and Program Evaluation, as well as in the implementation of the Defense Acquisition Workforce Development Fund. 
Through March 31st of this year, almost half the amount appropriated for this working capital fund, is nearly $400 million, has been obligated, and over 3,000 new workforce development funded employees have been brought on board. This is a critical first step in strengthening the in-house acquisition workforce. Hiring projections for the remainder of fiscal year 10 are on track to meet the Department's targets. The FY 2011 budget builds on this by including another $218 million for this workforce development fund. Acquisition workforce development is part of a much larger effort to reduce the Department's reliance on contractors by insourcing what is considered to be essential government work. The goal is to reduce contractors from the recent high of 39 percent of the DOD workforce back to 26 percent, the level that existed before 2001. Second, in addition to the Department's progress in acquisition reform, the budget request for fiscal year 2011 takes account of the savings generated by canceling programs that were deemed to be underperforming or over budget. The Secretary has clearly demonstrated his commitment to making difficult choices on acquisition programs, including an unprecedented number of program cancellations in the FY 2010 budget as well as the 2011 budget. Amongst them were the VH-71 presidential helicopter, the F-22 aircraft, and the Army's future combat system ground vehicle program. These further cancellations recommended for 2011 included the alternate engine for the F-35 aircraft, additional acquisitions of C-17 aircraft, the next generation cruiser, the new Navy intelligence aircraft, and the Defense Integrated Military Human Resources System, so-called DIMERS, which simply failed to live up to expectations. Lastly, the Secretary's guidance to DOD budgeteers follows several years of significant progress in financial management, especially in the areas of financial information and audit readiness. Several of our defense agencies now maintain auditable statements. Two large trust funds managed by DOD have either qualified or unqualified opinions. In particular, the Marine Corps has asserted audit readiness for their FY 2010 Statement of Budgetary Resources, and an audit is currently underway. The dollar value of those elements of defense, currently either auditable or under audit, is greater than 10 of the current CFO agencies, though there is still much more to accomplish. The Department has introduced a change of emphasis that reinforces the fact that financial audit is really an enterprise initiative. We are now concentrating on the kinds of budgetary information DOD managers use every day, specifically budget information and existence and completeness of assets. A stronger, better controlled business environment will produce both improved quality and more transparent financial information. We appreciate the support of the Congress to this new approach, and we have pledged to keep you apprised of our progress through semiannual reports on financial improvement and audit readiness. Mr. Chairman, this concludes my statement, and I'm open to any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Roth. Uh, Dr. Sproul. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, Chairman Tierney, Ranking Member Flake, and other distinguished members of the subcommittee, um, I'm honored to be here today. Thank you for the nice summary of my history. I would like to add two things. First, I'm proud to be a third generation federal employee. My grandfather worked at the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, and my father spent his career at the Federal Reserve. And I'm glad to um, follow in those footsteps. I'm also, uh, additional thing that I do for AT&L is that I provide authoritative data and analysis in support of the oversight of the acquisition programs. I'm pleased to come and talk today about defense acquisitions and discuss the broad trends, incentives, and challenges present in the Defense Department's current acquisition system for major weapons programs. For the past several years, the Department has been making changes to improve the acquisition process. Changes such as putting increased emphasis on the front end of the process. That means starting programs right, making and using material development decisions at program initiation, conducting preliminary design reviews before milestone B, budgeting to independent cost estimates, requiring competitive prototyping, implementing configuration steering boards, 
establishing program management agreements and completing independent program reviews. We have made support to the warfighter our highest priority and we are increasing and improving the acquisition workforce. The Department has initiated many improvements to the defense acquisition system just since the enactment of the Weapons Systems Acquisition Reform Act of 2009. In the areas of system engineering, developmental test and evaluation, technology maturity and cost estimation, with the goal of reestablishing a culture of acquisition excellence in the Department of Defense. The Department is committed to making trade-offs among cost, schedule, and performance to significantly reduce cost growth in major defense acquisition programs. The procedural and organizational changes required by WSARA complemented and reinforced many of the Department's recent policy changes, as Mr. Sullivan mentioned. The Department strongly supports and is aggressively implementing the WSARA requirements and will continue to seek additional ways to improve the effectiveness of our weapons systems process. As you mentioned, another important piece of the legislation is the Improve Acquisition Act, currently under debate. We look forward to working with the Congress as they finalize the provisions of this act and we have several issues we would like to discuss. We're committed to addressing the issues outlined in the improved legislation, as well as with SARA, so that improvements in acquisition systems serve and support the nation's warfighters and reduce cost growth in defense acquisition programs. Finally, I wanted to mention improving the acquisition workforce. Good people are the essential elements of any successful acquisition reform strategy. We're on track to meet the growth targets for rebuilding the civilian acquisition workforce in 2010 and beyond, and we are focusing on more than numbers. We are focusing on quality. We're pleased that we are attracting talented people to help us address the important issues we face every day. We look forward to working with the Congress as we develop an acquisition system that delivers value to the taxpayer and is responsive to the 21st century operating environment. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I will do my best to answer any question that you may have for me. Thank you. Thank you. That's all we can ask. Pardon? That, doing your best to answer the questions on that. Thank all of you for your testimony on that. It, it makes me think somewhat in, in listening to the, uh, Mr. Roth and Dr. Spruill that uh, maybe it's our impatience of getting to where we want to go a little bit quicker that, that, that drives some of our concern here on that. It, it is good to hear that a lot of the recommendations made formally by the General Accountability Office and by Congress and its legislation uh, is being implemented. I guess the question is, as I started at the outset, why, did it, why were those things not done to begin with, which probably unfair question to ask you. It wasn't on your watch and it seems that you're addressing them. Uh, are we moving as quickly as we can be moving, I guess, would be the next question on that. Are we really uh, progressing? Why are there still programs that are moving forward with immature technology? Why are there still programs that aren't getting the knowledge base that they need early enough in the, in the system programming? I'll try to answer that. As you know, there are now 102 major defense acquisition programs at all different phases of their life. Um, we have focused on, after talking with Congress and staffers, we have focused on programs that are at the beginning. Um, we personally just do not have the capability to address all 102 at once. The, um, the thinking uh, was if I get the programs up front and then they will um, be on the right track as they go down. We are, as you know, WSAR required us to look at meeting the uh, Milestone B certification requirements for any programs that were between Milestone B and Milestone C. We have started down that path. Um, it, it's, it is a difficult pa path in the sense that the older program is, the harder it is to find the, the information to structure, talk about the structure of the program. But well, we I guess are that would have been why it would have been helpful to have the, uh, the information and in, in giving us an assessment of where we were on those. So um, is that something you're moving toward doing as well? Yes, we are. And um, we, we are looking, 
Um, we have, um, as you know right now, we are um, working to implement the WASARA. We've stood up new offices. Um, they have some responsibilities, cost estimating, uh, performance assessment. And so we have started moving through the um, makeup certifications, as we call them. Um, we have tried to, the, the long pole in the tent to getting them done is the cost estimates. And uh, you all expanded in WSARA the uh, responsibility and the scope of the CAPE folks. And we have um, started to beef up those staff, as, as Mr. Roth mentioned, but they still, um, there's a lot of programs that need cost estimates as they're moving through the process today. So doing additional ones has been difficult, especially um, a while ago when they didn't have the staff. But we are moving toward doing those makeup certifications, um, and we hope to complete them. We have not completed them within the one year, but we hope to complete them as soon as possible thereafter. But the cost estimates are the hardest thing to move us through that process. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan, so if I ask you to assess Dr. Spruill's performance so far in terms of going to the early programs, the programs that are beginning, and, and it's not unreasonable to, to start there, how are we doing with those? Are 100 percent of those uh, getting the sort of uh, knowledge-based uh, assessments that they need early on? The, the critical indicator that we look at to, to see if a program's developing a good business case that will result in a good cost estimate is the technologies, as you know. And we're pleased to report in the last two years we've seen increased um, knowledge about the technologies, more mature technologies um, as the things that are required for the business case than in the past. In fact, last year uh, the department, I think 100 percent of the new starts were at what we call a technology readiness level six, which is a re reasonable technology maturity. We'd like to see it at seven. We disagree with them on that. But that's uh, unprecedented, really, that they've had that kind of thing. So, and I think one of the reasons for that was congressional action and the department itself changing policies a couple of years prior to this reform where they beefed up the uh, certification process for looking at technology maturity. Now that um, I believe it's ddr and &E now must uh, assess all of the technologies going into a weapon system. But it, it's also more than that.